Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the sergeant at arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senators, will you be so kind, members, as to stand for prayer? And today's chaplain is Missionary Farrells Hondo, who's with the Minnesota uh, News Rock. Uh, mosque in Coon Rapids. I begin in the name of God the Almighty, the God of Abraham, the God of Ishmael and Isaac, the God of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, the God who is the most gracious ever merciful. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings of God the Almighty be upon all of you. I am honored and humbled to stand before you today as a member and missionary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Muslims who believe that the Messiah has come, we join together today in prayer before our Creator. All praise belongs to God Almighty, Lord of all the worlds, the gracious, the merciful, master of the day of judgment. You alone do we worship, and you alone do we ask for help. Guide us on the right path, the path of those on whom you have bestowed your blessings, those who have not incurred your displeasure, and those who have not gone astray. O ye who believe, be strict in observing justice and be witnesses for God, even though it be against yourselves or against your parents or your relatives. Whether he be rich or poor, God is more regardful of them both than you are. Therefore, follow not low desires so that you may be able to act with justice. And if you conceal the truth or evade it, then remember that God is well aware of what you do. You are the representatives of the great people of this great state, and you have been entrusted with authority and power on their behalf. I pray that God grants you guidance and strength from himself so that may you fulfill the duties and obligations that have been placed on your shoulders so that you may be able to justly discharge of the trust placed upon you. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, members. The secretary will take the roll. Abler, Anderson, Barr, Bolden, Carlson, Champion, Coleman, Swadzinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Drezkowski, Duckworth, Diedzik, Eichhorn, Farnsworth, Fateh, Friends, Green, Grunhagen, Gustafson, Hoschild, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Jasinski, Johnson, Klein, Coran, Kroon, Kunish, Kapek, Lang, Latz, Liskey, Limmer, Lucero, Mann, Marty, Matthews, May Quaid, McEwen, Miller, Mitchell, Muhammad, Morrison, Murphy, Nelson, Umover, Baton, Pappas, Pa, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rasmussen, Rest, Seeberger, Utke, Weber, Wiesenberg, Westland, Westrum, Wickland, Zhang. Members, pursuant to Rule 14.1, the following members intend to vote under Rule 40.7. Desick, Minneapolis, Minnesota. May Quaid, Apple Valley, Apple Valley, Minnesota. And McEwen, Duluth, Minnesota. Members, a quorum is present. <laughs> members, we will begin at the third order of business, messages from the House. The Secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the passage by the House of the following House files herewith transmitted. House file numbers 19, 42, 
43 and 62. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, no action is required. We will now move to the fourth order of business. First reading of House bills. The House files have been given their first reading and referred as indicated. Members will now proceed to the fifth order of business. Reports of committees. Senator Kunis for a motion to adopt committee reports. Mr. President, I move the committee report printed in the agenda be adopted and I request a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any discussion? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Murphy, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Uh, Senator, excuse me, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator McQuaid votes aye. Senator McQuaid votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. And Senator McEwen votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. Members, all having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 47 ayes and 14 noes. The motion to adopt is adopted. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the sixth order of business, second reading of Senate bills. The secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file numbers 133, 1053, and 455. The Senate files have been given their second reading. We will now proceed to the seventh order of business, second reading of House bills. The secretary will read the House file numbers. House file numbers four and 121. The House files have been given their second reading. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the eighth order of business, introduction of first readings of Senate bills. The bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Members, as usual, if you want to follow along with me, you can by going to the Senate bill introductions. On page number one, Senate file number 1830 has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. If you go to second page, members, Senate file number 1836 has been referred to the Committee on Finance. Page three, three if you go to Senate file number 1854, that bill has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. If you proceed to page number four, Five. Page number five, members, you can see Senate file number 1870. That has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. We will also proceed to page number eight. If you go to page number eight, you'll see Senate file number 1900. That bill has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. On the same page, Senate file number 1902 has been referred to the Committee on Human Services services. We will now proceed to page 11. On page 11, you'll see Senate file number 1926. That's been referred to the Committee on Human Services. Proceed to page number 13. Senate file number 1947 has been referred to the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans. Page number 14, you'll see Senate file number 1958. That bill has been referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. And last, but certainly not least, if you go to page number 16, Senate file number 1969 has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. 
As I mentioned, uh, members, the bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. <laughs> members, we will now go to the ninth order of business, motions and resolutions. We will adopt the author's motion as one motion. All in favor say aye. Oh. Members, uh, uh, we will adopt the author's motion. There's one motion, uh, but, but there's also one motion to read. Uh, Senator Diesick moves that the names. The secretary will read the motion. <laughs> Senator Diesick moves that the name of Senator Kunish be added as the co author to Senate concurrent resolution number three. All right, any questions on that motion or discussion? Seeing none, all, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. As I mentioned, we will adopt the author's motion as one motion. All in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Bolden. Mr. President, I move that Senate File 3 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and be re-referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. This is uh, my bill, and I've spoken to both chairs, and they are in agreement. Thank you, Senator Bolton. You anticipated what I was going to ask. Senator Bolton moved that Senate File Number 3 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and re-referred to the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that uh, Senate File 743 be withdrawn from the Committee on Health and Human Services and re-referred to the Committee on Human Services. Uh, Mr. President, this is my bill, and I've talked to Senator Wicklund and Senator Hoffman, uh, and they are, concur with the uh, re-referral. Thank you so much. Senator Jasinski moved that Senate File Number 743 be withdrawn from the Committee on Health and Human Services and re referred to the Committee on Human Services. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Grudenhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I move that Senate File 883 be withdrawn from the Committee on Human Services and re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. I have contacted both chairs, and they've agreed to this move. And this is your bill, Senator? Yes, I'm the chief. Thank Bob. you so much. Senator Grudenhagen moved that Senate File number 883 be withdrawn from the Committee on Health and Human, excuse me, the Committee on Human Services and be re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move that Senate File 911 be withdrawn from the Committee on Transportation and re-referred to the Committee on Education Policy. This is my bill, and both chairs agree. Thank you, Senator Morrison. And Senator Morrison moves that Senate File 911 be withdrawn from the Committee on Transportation and be re-referred to the Committee on Education Policy. Any questions or any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Similarly, I move that Senate File 912 be withdrawn from the Committee on Education Policy and be re-referred to the Committee on Transportation. This is also my bill, and both chairs agree. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Senator Morrison moved that Senate File 912 be withdrawn from the Committee on Education Policy and re-referred to the Committee on Transportation. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and happy Mardi Gras celebration day in the Senate today. I move that Senate File 924 be withdrawn from the Committee on Human Services and re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. It is my bill, and I have spoken to both committee chairs, and they are in agreement. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Senator Lucero moved that Senate File 924 be withdrawn from the Committee on Human Services and re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Umu Verbaten. 
Mr. President, I move that Senate File 967 be withdrawn from the Committee on Human Services and re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. This is my bill, and the chairs are in agreement. Thank you, Senator Umu Verbaten. Senator Umu Verbaten moved that Senate File Number 967 be withdrawn from the Committee on Human Services and be re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1320 be withdrawn from the Committee on Human Services and be re-referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. This is my bill, and both chairs agree. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Senator Morrison moved that Senate File 1320 be withdrawn from the Committee on Human Services and re-referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. President. And just a note for the desk is that I'm actually changing this referral. I move that Senate File 1403 be withdrawn from the Committee on Housing and Homelessness Prevention and be referred to the Committee on Capital Investment. Senator Pappas. Oh. Yes, and this is, even though it says deed in the description, that's where many capital investment bills go to, to be uh, once they're appropriated. But it should go to capital investment. And Senator Pappas, is this your bill? And have you talked to both chairs? Yes, this is my bill. And uh, the chair of housing didn't want it. And the chair of capital investment would like it. Thank you, Senator Pappas. Senator Pappas moved that Senate File 1403 be withdrawn from the Committee on Housing and Homelessness Prevention and re referred to the Committee on Capital Investments. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1526 be withdrawn from the Committee on Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development and be re-referred to the Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy. This is my bill, and both chairs agree. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Senator Morrison moved that Senate File 1526 be withdrawn from the Committee on Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development and re-referred to the Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1632 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans and re referred to the Committee on Labor. Senator Hochschild, is this your bill and have you talked to both chairs? Yes and yes. Senator Hochschild moved that Senate File 1632 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans and re referred to the Committee on Labor. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1633 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans and re referred to the Committee on Education Finance. And is this your bill? And, and are both chairs in agreement? Yes and yes. Senator Hochschild moved that Senate File 1633 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans and referred to the Committee on Education Finance. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I move that Senate File, 6, Senate File 1772 be withdrawn from the Committee on Transportation, re-referred to the Committee on, Consumer and Cons on Commerce and Consumer Protection. I am the author, and both uh, chairs have agreed to the re-referral. Thank you, Senator Dames. Senator Dames moved that Senator file, Senate File 1772 be withdrawn from the Committee on Transportation and re-referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. All right, members, we will now proceed. We'll now proceed uh, to, uh, well, the secretary will report the Senate concurrent resolution number three. Senator Dizik introduced Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 3, a Senate Concurrent Resolution Adopting Deadlines for the 2023 Regular Session. 
Members, you can also find this resolution on your desk with the time and dates of each deadline. With that, uh, I, uh, the motion to adopt has been has been put forward, and we're now calling on Senator Kunish. Mr. President, I move Senate concurrent resolution number three be adopted. Any discussion? Send none. All those in favor, say aye. Uh, Senator uh, Kunis, um, I'm sorry, you are to explain the concurrent resolution. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator, Senator um, Senate concurrent resolution number three is the resolution adopting committee deadlines for the 2023 regular session. This resolution implements committee deadlines pursuant to Joint Rule 2.03 as provided in the letter from Senate leadership emailed on January 12, 2023. You will find the resolution on your desk with the time and dates of each uh, deadline. The first deadline is March 10th, uh, the second deadline is March 24th, and the third deadline is April 4th. And with that, I renew my motion to adopt Senate concurrent resolution number three, and I ask for a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Murphy, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Dietzik votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. Aaron May Quaid votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. All those having voted that desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 49 ayes and 13 noes. The uh, motion prevails. <laughs> Members remaining under the order of business, business of motions and resolutions, Senator Kunish. Mr. Mr. President, pursuant to Roll 26, I designate the following bills to made special orders for immediate consideration. And again, members, your list is on your desk. Thank you, Senator Kunis. Senator Herr. Mr. President, um, you refer to House File 50? That is correct, House File 50. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, Senate members, uh, House File 50 is a land bill, and the, the land bill gives direction to DNR and counties in selling and conveying state lands, including tax forfeited lands. Uh, House File 50 is a 2022 land bill, la lands bill. It's bipartisan, and it has regional representation as co author. It's, a, it's Senate companion to Senate File. 75 is co-authored by Senator Icorn, Senator House Chow, Senator Hoffman, and myself. In summary, House 550 allows the DNR to waive fee when, appro uh, when applicable, clarifies land lease authority, raise lease term on county tax freighted land, read and act certain sell authority requested by St. Louis County. This bill also makes some acreage changes to state parks and forests. Specifying this bill include at least 12 lands sell authorization in 10 counties, namely Batronomy, Cass, Crow Wing, Fillmore, Goodhue, Hennepin, St. Louis, and Sherbin counties. Note that House File 50 is the 2022 lands bill. It's non-controversial 
And I want to thank Senator Icorn for not only being the co-author of this bill, but also helped me present in the finance committee. It's time for us to pass this bill, House File 50, and get it uh, to the finish line with your votes. This will help local properties to put land on our tax roll and gain revenues. So thank you, members, and I ask for your support. Any additional discussion on House File 30? House File 50, I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Herr, for bringing this bill forward. He's correct, this is the 2022 lands bill. Uh, no controversy in this. Uh, for some of you that don't like it when the state buys land to take off the tax roll, there's almost none of this, none of that in this bill. It's mostly selling land back, putting land back on the tax roll. It's a good bill, and in the words of former Senator Tomasoni, it's a good bill, vote green, and I would encourage everyone to vote green on this bill. I know it passed the House, excuse me, the other body, 128 to zero. Thank you, Mr. President. Any further discussion on House File 50? Seeing none, the Secretary will give it his third reading. House File number 50, a bill for an act relating to state lands, modifying requirements for conveying easements and leasing state lands. Third reading. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, the Secretary will take the roll on final passage. Members, please vote. <laughs> Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. On Senate File 50, Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. All those, ha all those having voted that desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 64 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Senator Marty. Mr. President, I move that the amendment made to House File 35 by the Committee on Rules and Administration the report adopted February 1st, 2023, pursuant to Rule 45 be stricken. Senator Marty moves that the amendment made to House File 35 by the Committee on Rules and Administration in the report adopted February 1st, 2023, pursuant to Rule 45, be stricken. Any discussion? Senator Klein. Mr. President, I request a roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Any additional discussion? Senator Marty. Mr. President, just to explain, this is taking the House language and the biggest change in it is one that they have an effective date, immediate effective date, which is what we intended, and I urge you to support this. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call vote was requested and a roll call was granted. The secretary would take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Murphy. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator McQuaid votes aye. Senator McQuaid votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. All those having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 36 ayes and 26, 28 noes. The motion to strike pursuant to Rule 45 is adopted. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. House File 35 is a simple bill, simply changes how we have the state um, economists and the MMB figure out the forecast. This is a nothing to do with any spending, nothing to do with any revenue raising. This bill, the only implication of it is that we want them to give us accurate forecasts. And just to explain, basically, a forecast is, well, I think we're all paying attention to certain forecasts this week, specifically weather forecasts. And the weather forecasts, we want them to be as accurate as we can, whether that means the Senate should meet on Thursday in person or not or whatever committees, all those decisions, we have to make them. But we want the best information we can. We want the most accurate forecast we can get. This was changed. The law was changed. Minnesota is the only state that does this. But 20-some years ago, two legislators who both happened to be running against each other for governor both wanted the numbers to look better. So they said, look, if we don't factor in the inflation on one side of the equation, just the other side, it'll make the numbers look rosier. I think this is not transparent. It's not an accountable way of doing things. This bill, as I said, is very simple. It simply changes it back to the way it's always been, the way every other state does it, the way every business does things. You want the accurate forecast. This does not, as I said, spend money. It does not raise money. It's simply making sure the forecast is accurate. Um, in your, on your desk, you should have a in uh, commentary from five former commissioners of finance who served under Perpich, Carlson, Ventura, Pawlenty, and I believe those four governors and the current administration would accept this, support this as well. But bottom line is every economist wants you to have accurate numbers. A forecast does not spend any money. It does not raise any money. It's simply giving you honest information so that we as a legislature can put together a good budget. I urge your support. Senator Dames. Oh, I thought it was Senator Dames. I thought your hand was up. Any further discussion? Oh, Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And when we look at this bill, it talks about inflation, but it does not include deflation or neutral growth. So when we were in Finance Committee, this was discussed, and I did uh, ask Commissioner Showalter if he felt that should be included in there, and he felt that that would be a good idea. So, Mr. Chair, I have the A-50 Amendment. Senator Dames offers the A-50 Amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dames moves to amend House File number 35 as follows. Page 2, line 2, after the period, insert. This is the A50 Amendment. Senator Dames, to your A50 Amendment. What this will do is it will add uh, that it can mean positive, negative, or neutral growth. And I think that that's important. Uh, when, we were, when we talked about this in Finance Committee, it was assumed that that's the way it would be. But... Uh, as we all know, assumptions don't always work out the way they should be, and I think that it's just a simple piece of language that clarifies exactly what we should be doing and what is meant by this. So, members, I would encourage a green vote. Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, I request a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Dames, if you look at the bill, House File 35, in the first paragraph, it talks about the other side of the equation, uh, or the other part of the forecasting. The forecast must assume continuation of current laws and reasonable estimates of projected growth in the national and state economies. Growth in the economy sometimes is negative. Sometimes we have recessions. 
Growth implies positive and negative growth. Inflation implies positive and negative growth. This is the way the law was always in the past. Other states do it this way. You don't need that language, and it tends to muck up the thing when you start saying, uh, well, what if there's positive, negative, or neutral growth? That's implied. That's the same thing we have earlier in the bill. It's always been that way, saying this half is doing that. Somebody could say, oh, then projected growth is only positive, so maybe we should amend that as well. Urge you to reject this. It's not needed. It doesn't serve anything other than to confuse. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I think as Senator Marty just alluded to, the definition of inflation and deflation is relatively synonymous. But members, if I were to go to Investpedia, which you can decide whether it's, it's credible or not, uh, there is a very distinct difference between inflation and deflation. It states inflation is an increase in general prices of goods and services in the economy, and deflation conversely is the general decline in prices in goods and for goods and services, indicated by an inflation rate that falls below 0%. There is a difference. And by saying inflation, we are signaling that we're only going to count the increases rather than any potential decreases. Now, admittedly, there have been few negative uh, inflationary periods in our future, but they have occurred. And so, members, I, offer, I encourage you to vote in favor of the Dames Amendment. And, Senator Dames, I'm going to come back to you after we make sure that we have everyone. I'll make sure that you can be the last person up, if that's okay. Uh, any other discussion? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as Senator Pratt just alluded to, there is a difference. And I, I just don't see any reason why there's so much pushback to add this clarity in the language. It's, uh, it needs to be clarified. It can be clarified. And uh, I, I just don't see why there's all this pushback uh, to something that simplifies things, makes it very much, it makes it clearer, makes it plainer, and gives us a better direction to follow in those times. I think there's been two times in the last 23 years when there's actually been some negative growth. So uh, I would disagree with Senator Marty and ask that the folks uh, vote green on this bit, on this amendment. Thank you. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. The secretary will take the roll on on amendment, the A50 amendment. Members, please vote. <laughs> Senator Murphy, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dizik votes no. Senator Dizik votes no. Senator McQuaid votes no. Senator McQuaid votes no. Senator McEwen votes no. Senator McEwen votes no. And Senator Port votes no. And Senator Port votes no. Members, make sure you vote.
All those voting, all those having voted who decided to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 31 ayes and 34 noes, the amendment is not adopted. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Marty yield for a question? Senator Marty will yield. Senator Marty will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Marty, you described the reason for this bill to provide an accurate forecast, to be transparent, and to do honest budgeting. Uh, Senator Marty, uh, what is the expected inflation rate uh, impact for fiscal year 24 and 25? Senator Marty. Mr. President, uh, Senator Pratt, I'm not sure. I'm waiting for the February forecast next week. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, according to the November, would Senator Marty yield for another question? Senator Marty will yield. He will yield, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Marty, as of the November forecast, was there an estimate of inflation and how much was that? Senator Marty. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Pratt, it was about $1.55 I think, for the first biennium, and I'm not sure about the second one. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Members on your desk, I've provided a, a couple of pieces, um, and Senator Marty's right. It is $1.55 uh, in inflationary cost and $3.3 billion uh, cumulative. Uh, going into the second biennium. Uh, Senator Marty, do we include inflation in our revenue forecast? Senator Marty, it, uh, 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 sorry, Mr. President, would Senator Marty yield? Senator Marty, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Marty, because you did ask the question, correct? All right, Senator Marty. Um, Mr. President, uh, Senator Pratt, I'm not sure if I understand what you mean. Um, the forecast numbers, they, they project, the MMB has generally tried to project what the numbers would be. They just can't include them in the forecast for where the numbers stand right now. So um, this would simply, they do put it on the charts, at the bottom of the charts. I think this would simply, we're not asking them to do every line item in the budget. We're simply saying we'd like to know the overall numbers. And so that's what it would be, the 1.55 or whatever it, the new forecast, I'm not expecting it to be significantly different, but again, I'm not the forecaster. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Mar Senator Marty yield for another question? Senator Marty, will you yield? He will yield, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Senator Marty. In committee, you testified that we include inflation in the, in the revenue forecast, but not in the spending forecast as part of the rationale for passing this bill. Uh, Senator Marty, am I mistaken? or? As I passed out to all the members a copy of the revenue forecast, can you show me where inflation is factored into the revenue forecast? Senator Marty. Mr. President, Senator Pratt, the inflation is factored in because they calculate what they think inflation is going to do to wages, what it's going to do to sales, what it's going to do to everything else, and they collect the estimates for the taxes. The revenues we collect are based on that inflation. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And, you know, I would disagree with my colleague, uh, Senator Marty, because the state isn't factoring in inflation when they, factor, when they do the revenue forecast. They're factoring economic activity. In fact, from the years 2005 to 2015, wages grew at a rate much, much higher than the rate of inflation. Members, I have handed out a, uh, an editorial from former Commissioner, uh, fin uh, MMB Commissioner Peter Hutchinson, which basically uh, states that. In fact, it, it'll say on uh, page two of that document, personal income grew at twice the rate of inflation in the 10 years from 2005 to 2015. The cost of goods and services, the cost of employment, all of the economic factors are not necessarily inflation. The revenue forecast does not look at CPI and say, okay, we're going to juice up our revenue by that amount. It's simply looking at economic activity. In the meantime, members, we're looking at spending based on current law. 
And as Senator Marty has just shown, and as you can see, members, from the uh, uh, budgetary outlook that I provided, we do have an estimate of inflation of $1.55 billion in fiscal year 24-25, and then cumulative $3.3 billion in fiscal year 26-27. Would Senator Marty yield for another question? Senator Marty, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Senator Marty. So, Senator Marty, I've got the, uh, I've got the budgetary outlook. I've got the, uh, uh, the $17.6 billion forecast. Isn't it already transparent? If somebody wanted to factor in the inflationary impact, couldn't they just subtract those two numbers? Senator Marty, to the question. Um, Mr. President, Senator Pratt, um, you, can, you can do math, and I can do math, and I think we all can. I think it's important to have the numbers factored in the right way. With your revenue forecast sheet, you ask what the inflation is. Well, that's all already embedded in there. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I agree, Senator Marty. It's already embedded in there. We already have the information. The budget forecast is accurate and it's transparent. And the budget forecast is not a budgetary tool, it's a forecasting tool. We will get into the budget process later on. This assumes that there's an automatic increase in government where state statute doesn't already include that increase. In fact, members, there are several categories in our budget where we automatically increase the amount we spend due to inflationary increase, and this is above and beyond that. And so what we're saying, members, is if you go with this bill, you are assuming that government will grow at the, at the rate of inflation above and beyond what's already factored in the state law that the forecast will presume what we as a legislature will spend. Mr. President, I request members vote no. Senator, is it okay for me to go to third reading and you still can speak? Is that okay? Third reading. House file number 35, a bill for an act relating to state government requiring the state forecast to include the rate of inflation. Third reading. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, um, we have before us a bill to turn government spending onto autopilot, actually to give the executive branch the ability to turn government spending onto autopilot. I listened closely to the interaction uh, that Senator Pratt had here with Senator Marty. I'm wondering if Senator Marty would yield um, again. Mr. Senator Marty, President. will you yield? He will yield, Senator Jaskowski. So, Senator Marty, I'm reading the bill, and it modifies existing law in Chapter 16A.102, Subdivision B. Um, and the way the law writes, and you're amending it to add the rate of inflation, the application of inflation into it, but the way the law reads is it says that the executive branch must simply inform the leaders in the legislature in the budgeting area. So the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, both the minority and majority, must be told what the executive branch believes the inflation is and how it's applied and if it's applied correctly. And in the law, they will, with this bill, have to do that at two different points in time. Now, my question, Mr. President and Senator Marty, is what is the recourse under your bill, Senator Marty, around the addition of inflation and the application of it? What is the recourse that the legislative branch will have under this newly formed or amended law? What recourse will we have if we disagree with the executive branch in their calculation and application of the new autopilot increase that your bill is going to provide to government spending. Senator Marty. 
Mr. President, first of all, the bill does not put any spending on autopilot. Um, the one thing I will remind you of is that this second paragraph where they are required to consult with us and make sure there's sort of agreement on how they're calculating the numbers, there's no change in that. And bottom line, again, this is a forecast. You might disagree with the weather forecast. You can argue with it. You can say they're really incompetent weather forecasters. You can do whatever you want with it, but that's their forecast. You don't have to listen to the forecast. You can ignore it. You can say, we're going to do, don't need coats or anything this week. We, we'll be fine. You can do whatever you want. It's not a question of doing anything more than saying, you're saying, well, what if we disagree with the forecast and the way they're doing it? Well, you can say you disagree with it. It doesn't change anything we do here other than making sure we have the most accurate forecast we can get. Uh, Senator Marty, I just want to remind you that we have two meteorologists that we really do believe in, so I just want to make sure that you're clear about that. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm signing up to be the third in an, in an area that doesn't have to do with weather, if we, if we would here. Mr. President, this does put government spending on autopilot. And Senator Marty, I, I understand what you're saying, but the reality is, Senator Marty, members, Mr. President, that this law directs the executive branch on how to develop the state's budget forecast. We are amending it and simply telling the executive branch all they have to do in applying this new autopilot increase to spending on state government in the forecast, all they have to do is notify us. There is no recourse for the legislative branch. We are handing them, Mr. President, all of this power, all of this authority, and all of this discretion without any recourse on our end. What in the separation of powers, Mr. President, in our state government, what interest do we have in simply conveying to the executive branch that type of power? Why would we do that, Mr. President? We are putting government spending in its calculations on autopilot increase. And Senator Marty, I understand what you said, but the reality is once the forecast comes out, both in November and the one that's going to be coming at the end of this month, once it comes out, it has a great amount of influence on what the people of Minnesota understand the spending to be. So if you show the people of Minnesota, Mr. President, the number, the way it's calculated now, before we go in and amend it and put an autopilot increase in it in the budget forecast, that's, gonna, that's, going, to, that's going to be a sharp contrast from the autopilot increase amount that comes out. And we have to be honest with the people of Minnesota here. We, the legislative branch, the members of the state senate who the people of minnesota sent us here to fulfill the constitutional autonomy that we have in the constitution separation of powers in this bill are conveying to the executive branch power that is in no interest of this branch as we represent those people who sent us here we have one chief executive over there in the executive branch, and I would, I would submit, Mr. President, if the, if the chief executive was from a different party, the party bringing this particular bill wouldn't have the type of interest in the way that this was written. We are not doing our constitutional duty under this law and protecting our separation of powers. Members, we have done this again and again in our history. We are making ourselves a weak legislature. This bill, as it's written, makes this legislature even weaker. Members, and Senator Marty, if you want to do this and put in, and I understand Democrats want to put government on autopilot increases each year. That's what this does, but if you want to do it, at least give this branch, this Senate, and that House over there the ability to have some recourse in that discussion. We are simply conveying it to, to the executive branch. 
This is not the right way to do it. Members, let's defeat this bill and Senator Marty can bring back another one tomorrow or the next day that actually contemplates the, the rightful authority and responsibility of the Minnesota legislature in this discussion. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, and I have many of the same concerns that Senator Pratt and Senator Draskowski just voiced. And, but I've got another concern, too, and that's the other thing this bill doesn't do. It doesn't take into consideration the impact of inflation on the private sector, and especially people on fixed income and low-income people. You know, with, uh, since the Biden administration has taken office, uh, there's been several estimates on the uh, reduced purchasing power that an American family has in the, in the state of Minnesota, er, across this country. According to a heritage analysis, it effectively reduced purchasing power for an American family, including Minnesota, over $7,400 a year. Some estimates put the inflation impact on, on the private sector, that means our businesses and our low-income and fixed individuals, uh, at over $10,000 since the Biden administration took, took office. So, you know, to take any type of a step where we're putting any type of an auto uh, increase on state budget uh, is gravely going in the wrong direction. The other thing I just say, if we look at uh, the spending in this that's been proposed in this session, we see the governor's budget wants to increase spending by over 25% in one biennium. Think about that, members. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know too many people in my district, if any, that their income is going up 25%, either business or individuals. So we are, we are spending at a rate that is totally out of balance with the people that actually pay the income. We should, we should base our spending on the growth of the private sector and personal income versus just willy-nilly, we got a lot of one-time money in our uh, $17.6 billion surplus. It's one-time money, and yet every bill I see seems to create ongoing spending. This is gonna create a huge economic disaster in the future with huge deficits. I don't want that, and I don't think any of you want that. And to, and to add to that by adding inflation into the state forecast, without uh, some oversight from the House and the Senate, whatever that might be, is simply going in the wrong direction. Members, again, in 2010, uh, our biennium budget was about $29 billion, two-year budget. By 2022, it was up to $52 billion. Well, that's a 55% increase over 12 years. The governor's budget proposes a 25% increase in one biennium. You're going to crush the private sector, you're going to hurt the poor, and people on fixed incomes. Remember, if you don't want to believe me, believe uh, 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 Milton Friedman, who was a Nobel Prize winning economist. He said inflation is taxation without legislation, because you're decreasing the value of the purchasing power of those families. The growth of government has to be brought into balance with the private sector, the ones who actually pay the bills. We're going at an exponential rate that is going to seriously damage individuals, families, and the private sector. Please send this bill back. Let's do something rational rather than just uh, uh, promote a philosophy that's going to damage the private sector and, and especially the low income and the um, uh, fixed income people in our state. Please vote no. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I too am standing to urge my colleagues to vote no on House File 35. And I want the people of Minnesota to know what this legislature is attempting to do and what this majority is bringing to the floor. This bill is a small bill. It fits on one, page, one sheet of paper, but, and there's only a few words being changed in the legislation, but it has tremendous and profound impacts that's going to affect every single Minnesotan. 
by adding inflation into the forecast in Minnesota's budget, it is one more tool for your state government under this trifecta control that we have right now to take money out of Minnesotans' pockets and keep it in government coffers. That's what this bill is going to do. One more tool for the $17.6 billion surplus that the government and the majority is sitting on, like the Scrooge McDuck pot of gold, and not giving that money back to the people of Minnesotans who want their money back. Adding inflation to the, uh, to the forecasting process is going to reduce the amount of money that we will be declaring to Minnesotans that we have in our overall surplus and will justify government keeping more of your money in government coffers rather than putting it back in your pocket. And Mr. President, it's been amazing to see as we've gone through the first month and a half so far this session, we're gonna be fortunate if we even wrestle a social security exemption out of uh, the majority control right now, because even though members on both sides of the aisle routinely talk about it, uh, the votes continually be defeat are defeated on party lines for bringing that forward. And adding bills in like this is going to make it that much harder to even bring small solutions like full social security exemption to the people of Minnesota. The second section of this bill is what some of my colleagues were just discussing, giving the power to the executive branch of coming and discussing the rate of inflation and the application of inflation to the legislature. Uh, it was stated that this was for already an existing language that we're not changing that, but Mr. President, you read the existing language and today it's only applying to state bonding and the affected debt service. But section two of this bill is now adding a new process that the executive gets to use in what they tell the legislature, and that is going to be determining what the executive's opinion of the rate of inflation and the application of inflation is to the finance chairs in the two branches of the legislature. And there is no recourse for that, and it's one more tool that we're giving, empowering uh, the executive branch, who under this administration is trying to take as much power for themselves as they can and hold it all, take it away from the legislature. And this bill is one more tool that's taking Minnesotans' voice away from our elected representatives and senators and putting it in an executive branch. Finally, Mr. President, a very small, uh, but could be overlooked change in Section 3, the effective date. This bill says that this act is effective the day following final enactment. And the reason why the majority is bringing this today is because they want it to get passed to impact and reduce the number of the final budget surplus that's coming out at the end of this month. And putting this in place will reduce that number from the 17.6 or whatever the number uh, adjusted uh, up or down would be, and will deflate that number for Minnesotans, have a smaller number that gets announced uh, to the people of Minnesota. And it's going to be one more tool that the majority wants to use even today to justify their own increases, to justify their spending, and to justify not giving money back to the people of Minnesota. Mr. President and members, while there's just a few changes to this bill, this is profoundly impactful to the people of Minnesota. This should not be adopted, and I'd urge all my colleagues to resoundly reject this bill. Thank you, Mr. President. And members, before we go to Senator Westrom, I want to make sure that I put others on the list who wants to be on the list, because the last two people that we will hear from will be Senator Pratt and then uh, Senator Marty. So I just want to give you that fair warning. So if there's anyone else who wants to be on the list, please, please let me know. Senator Westrom. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, would Senator Marty yield for a few questions? Senator Westrom. Would Senator Marty yield for a few questions, Mr. President? Senator Marty, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Westrom. 
Mr. President, uh, Senator Marty, uh, you talked about 20 years ago or so uh, this uh, change was made. Can you uh, uh, refresh the body? Uh, who, uh, who controlled the Senate, uh, Democrats or Republicans, and who controlled the House at that time, and what year are you referring to? Senator Marty, to the question. Mr. President, Senator, um, Senator Westrom, I'm not sure. I think it was 2001. It was um, right before gubernatorial campaign, and I'm not sure who controlled the House. I believe the DFL controlled the Senate, but there was one Republican and one Democrat who were running for governor who thought this would make the numbers look better. And I think it was a poor decision then. I thought it was then. I think it is now. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, Senator Marty, if you'd continue to yield. Senator Marty will continue to yield. Uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. President, Senator Marty, uh, you referred to a couple times now uh, two legislators that were running for governor uh, that allegedly uh, were, were the push behind this. Could you let the body know who are the two people, legislators you're referring to? Senator Marty. Mr. President, um, Senator Westrom, I don't. I was not intimately involved in those discussions at the time, but I believe it was um, former Representative Pawlenty and former Senator Moe. Senator Westrom. Thank you, uh, Senator Marty. Uh, Mr. President, members, some of us were here in the legislature before those years, and Senator Marty, you were here. Uh, I think we need to uh, enlighten or share the experience with anybody that didn't see how government was operating before this change was made. As Senator Marty just pointed out, it was former Senator Majority Leader, DFL member, Roger Moe, that agreed to the change and the Democrats were in control in the Senate back in 2001. The governor's office was actually in control by an independent governor, Governor Jesse Ventura, for those that don't remember. And the House of Representatives was under control of the Republican majority. Tim Pawlenty was the majority leader. Speaker of the House was Steve Swiggum. But members, this change was a practical and a needed change in 2001 because what was happening was government spending was put on autopilot before this change. And to go back to putting the government spending train on autopilot is the wrong direction. We need to stop the government spending train. And this is just one little piece in doing it. One little piece. Government spending has always gone up year after year. But members, if we bake inflation into the automatic budget, we take that much more pressure off of agencies, off of executive branch, off of legislative committees to find savings find efficiency in setting budgets for the government. Because we don't have a printing press in the basement here of the Capitol. Our source of income is the hardworking taxpayers across my district, Senate District 12, and the rest of the state. And we need to respect all of those families, all of those hardworking taxpayers, that put money in the state government coffers. And if you support this today, putting government spending on autopilot, we're telling all of those hardworking Minnesotans, your budgets don't matter. State government's got priority over your family budget. Because the family budget doesn't have automatic inflation built into it. When costs go up, like people have seen in the last two years on fuel, groceries, you name it, it's up under this administration. And they've had to just figure out a way to make it work. 
and government should have to do the same. And so there was a strong bipartisan consensus at the turn of the century that it is time to take government off autopilot. And that's why this change was put into place, to look at realistic numbers, realistic numbers that show you exactly where the budget is at. As Senator Pratt has pointed out, there is an inflation number we can look at, 1.5 billion or 3.3 over the next biennium if we want to add them in and not expect government to find any efficiencies. But the legislature then can deal with those numbers. Once you bring those inflation numbers into the budget automatically, you'll never see the lower realistic number of what the current budget is. All of the discussion around the committees, and if any of you haven't been here, you don't know. We changed it because everybody thought it was a cut. If something got less than what the inflation budget showed. And so to be honest with the budgeting process of state government, the best way to deal with it was take inflation and make it separate. So at least you're dealing honestly with the taxpayers and the agencies you're funding. We can know what the base budget is, what inflation is if we have enough extra money to put into it, or what other ways can we find efficiencies in government. So while this is on less than one page of a bill, this is a big deal. This is a slap in the face to any taxpayer out there, any family budget that doesn't get to put their budget on autopilot. And it's saying state government spending is going to take priority over any family budget. We don't care. Because we're going to bake it in the state government cake and keep government spending train on the track, rolling ahead. That's what the Democrats' priority seems to be under this bill. Members, there is a good reason this was changed just over 20 years ago. Let's not go back and put the government spending train back on autopilot. Let's leave it as it is. Let's be honest with the taxpayers that we have the fiduciary obligation to represent, to use their tax money the best way we can. And one of the best ways is, is to also expect government spending to find efficiencies, to maybe change the way they're doing things because they shouldn't be on autopilot, and that's what this bill does. So I urge members to vote no. Stop this reckless government spending train that the Democrats are trying to push through. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, would Senator Marty yield for a brief question? Please. Senator Marty, will you yield? He will yield, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Marty. And I apologize if this was covered earlier and I missed it. Uh, I'm just curious, as it pertains to this bill and uh, measuring inflation, which indicator the state is supposed to use or would be required to use to determine what rate of inflation they would be factoring into the forecast that we are discussing? Senator Marty, to the question. Mr. President, I believe the state economist uses a number of different indexes for various parts of it. Um, it's Again, my, that's the kind of internal details. I don't know how weather forecasters make their forecasts. I'm not a scientist. I don't do that, but I kind of trust how they come out. I want them to do their professional job. I want the state economist to do the same, and that's what they've had the freedom to do and will have the freedom to do again. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. If Senator Marty would please yield for a brief follow-up. Senator Marty, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Marty. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the answer to the question. Uh, I guess to the best of your knowledge, would it be fair to say then that whatever is used to determine the rate of inflation could vary from year to year, budget cycle after budget cycle? Senator Marty. Mr. President, Senator Duckworth, I, I don't know if it varies from year to year. I think it, well, it, as they get new forecasting methods and so on, things change. But I think like in the inflation and the revenue side of things, they're using a number of different 
ways of determining what the rates would be. So, so it depends on the part of the economy, how they do it. Again, it's, it's in the weeds for me. I, I just want the professionals to use their expertise and make the best judgment they can. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Marty. I appreciate that. And um, that illustrates one of the concerns I have regarding this bill and uh, an apparent potential lack of legislative oversight. I think if we're going to talk about transparency and accuracy, an important aspect of that is consistency. And the way this bill reads, uh, it allows for potentially uh, various methods to be utilized depending upon whoever happens to be determining what we're going to use for the rate of inflation as we're looking at what we're going to forecast in terms of potential budget surpluses. And if we're trying to be transparent, and we don't have spelled out in the bill exactly what indicators to be used time after time after time, then I don't know how we're going to judge whether or not our forecasts are consistent. And what that leads me to potentially have a concern about as we're talking about transparency and accuracy is the ability for whoever is determining what indicators we're going to use to artificially reduce or underreport a surplus to potentially justify raising taxes or not reducing them. As an example, if we're talking about our current projected budget surplus of $18 billion, well, some of the uh, inflation indicators would have that get reduced potentially to $15 billion. It's important for the public to know that. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about taking what are projected forecasts and with a wave of a pen reducing their numbers. And here's why that's important. Uh, it might not sound like a lot in that, in that scenario, but when we're talking about things like the elimination of a tax on Social Security, or we're talking about significant tax income tax reductions for Minnesotans, well, artificially underreporting or just changing those numbers based on whatever indicator someone decides to use has very significant implications, as was shared earlier. You know, the government doesn't need the numbers stacked any more in its favor and against the little guy. And uh, this conversation, I think, is highlighting something very important. Um, it is. It's tough to budget, and it's tough to forecast. Tell that to our seniors. Tell that to our hardworking Minnesota families. And tell that to our small business owners who can't, just with the wave of a pen, make the numbers work in their favor. We are failing them by not focusing on and prioritizing their needs. If the state of Minnesota, sitting on an $18 billion surplus, feels the need to adjust those numbers down, I can only imagine what the, what the people of Minnesota are feeling. And I'll wrap up by saying this, Mr. President, there are a whole host of initiatives working through the state legislature right now that have our small businesses and families and seniors completely terrified because they have no idea how much things are going to increase for them when it comes to their tax burden, when it comes to their cost of living, and they don't have the ability to do what we're discussing here today, which is to simply reset things a little bit to make life a little bit easier. Instead of prioritizing the state of Minnesota making some adjustment, what we should be prioritizing is making the much needed long overdue adjustments for the people of this state whom this legislature serves. Thank you. Members, we're going to Senator Nelson, then to Senator Pratt, and then finally to Senator Marty. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise in opposition to House File 35. Members, let, I, I've heard a lot of things that would just need a, a, a tad a clarification. Um, we must make sure, the public must know that yes, we know what the expected inflationary costs are. Those are recorded. You can find them on page 18 of the long-term budget outlook. Those are there for every Minnesotan, for anyone to note. So there's no hiding of inflationary numbers. They are right there, black and white. But the question is, what is the purpose of the state budget forecast? The state budget forecast is to take a look at current law and current revenues and line those things up so Minnesota lawmakers and the public know if the current laws are in place, what are our revenue projections? That does not include 
the inflationary costs. In fact, one could think that including inflationary costs in our budget outlook would be like, could that be synonymous with inflationary costs in your tax liability, how much you owe in taxes? We would not do that to Minnesotans. It's important that we know what inflationary costs are, but it's even more important that Minnesota elected officials listen to their constituents and prioritize and know if we want to do something differently, this is how much more it would cost. This is how many more taxes would need to be raised if we did not reduce somewhere else. So do not tie the hands of your of Minnesota legislatures. Make sure that the facts are there, the inflationary costs are there, but they're not included in the, in, in the budget. So I rise against this proposal. One other item to note is there are already some inflationary costs in our economic outlook, particularly in uh, education. So again, this is not necessary. We have inflationary costs. We need to use our outlook for what it was intended to determine current revenues and current law. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. When we started this debate, Senator Marty said the purpose of this bill was to provide an accurate forecast and to be transparent. Members, we've shown the forecast is already accurate. In fact, I talked to the previous three chairs of the Finance Committee, and they've all agreed that inflation as a budgetary tool, not a forecasting tool. In the article that I sent to you from Peter Hutchinson, there seems to be some discrepancy on when this change occurred because former Commissioner Hutchinson claims credit for this back in 1990, 33 years ago, under the Perpich administration. And he says our current law, what the law requires approach, has the advantage of linking the forecast to a fixed base, current law. As Senator Nelson just highlighted, it pushes decision makers to decide whether they want to buy inflation in old programs and prove those programs to get more for their money or buy new higher priority programs. Senator Marty mentioned it's a forecast. It's just a forecast. Forecasts can be wrong. I can tell you, I've spent 30 years in banking and financial services, and every forecast I've seen is wrong. But they're not this wrong. At the beginning of this biennium in 2021, the February forecast projected that we would have a $260,000 surplus. We only missed it by $11.3 billion. We missed the forecast by $11.3 billion over these last two years. And had this law been in effect, we wouldn't have had a projected $260,000 surplus. We would have had a $780,000 deficit that we would have had to manage to, simply because we estimated that the inflationary costs were going to have an impact. Members, think about that. Many of you were here in 2021 whether you were in this chamber or the other chamber. We would have been talking about potentially tax increases. We would have been talking about cutting programs. Instead, we had a more accurate, more transparent forecast. Senator Marty proved the information is already available and the math can be done. As Senator Duckworth highlighted, we would see a decrease in our current projection for this coming biennium down to $10.1 billion and about $14.3 billion in the second biennium. Members, this seems like 
a pretty insignificant bill. We're just adding inflation into the forecast. But it has a profound effect on how we do our business. As Senator Duckworth just highlighted, whether or not we can afford to give tax relief to seniors, whether we can afford to give tax relief to working Minnesota families. Members, it's my opinion that the primary impact of this legislation is not to increase transparency, is not to increase accuracy. The primary impact will be to dampen our ability to give tax relief to hardworking Minnesotans by overestimating the amount that we're going to spend. And as Senator, or I'm sorry, Commissioner Hutchinson described his, his change 33 years ago, it puts us, as Senator uh, Draskowski mentioned, decision makers to decide whether they want to buy inflation in programs. Members, we start our budget with current law, and this presumes spending that has not been authorized by the legislature. Mr. President, I oppose the bill because I believe the bill and adding inflation into the forecast will harm transparency and will make our forecast less accurate than they are today. And I think Minnesotans deserve to have our legislatures working with the most accurate information we have. And this should not be a tool to dampen our ability to return surplus money back to hardworking Minnesota families. Mr. President, I urge members to vote no on this bill. Senator Marty for final comments. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I urge your support for the bill. I'm not going to rebut every argument that made about saying autopilot a hundred times over makes it real. A forecast is significantly different from the work we do here. Just like a weather forecast is significantly different from how you react to what weather you face. You like to have the best possible information in front of you. When this bill passed, I was just digging it up, when this bill passed in 2002, Governor Ventura vetoed the bill. He actually commented on this provision in the bill. He says, I've heard claims this bill removes automatic spending growth apparently by removing inflation in the numbers used to plan the budget. Removing estimated inflation from our state forecast simply lowers our financial management standards, but it doesn't mean inflation won't happen. He vetoed the bill because of it. The legislature thought it knew better and decided to override that. But we have in your packet, again, um, com commissioners, five different state finance commissioners, including John Gunyu, who served under Arne Carlson, and Peggy Ingeson, who served under Governor Pawlenty, and a couple others who served under other DFL and the independent, um, Independence Party governor. All of them making the same argument. You can argue with the forecast all you want. You cannot like the forecast all you want, but I think as we're finding out this week, we do listen the best knowledge we can have, whether it's in weather forecasts or in budget forecasts. We want accurate information. That's all this does. I urge your support. The secretary will take the, the role on final passage of House File 35. Members, please vote. Senator Murphy, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator May Quaid votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. Members, please vote.
Senator Rust, please vote. All having voted that desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 30 noes, the bill passes and the title agreed to. <laughs> Members, we will now go to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interests. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Weber, all day. Icorn, 11 o'clock to 11.25. Miller, 11 o'clock to 11.15. Rarick, all day. Lang, from 11 o'clock to 11.35. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I once again, on behalf of former Senator Kent and Senator Lucero and myself, invite you to enjoy Mardi Gras with us in the President's Conference Room. We still have king cake and um, coffee. Uh, chicory coffee, and we've been having a great time. And I enjoy. I invite you once again to um, uh, to join us before you uh, leave for the day. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Letts. Mr. President, Judiciary Committee will convene in 15 minutes. Thank you, Senator Hur. Uh, Mr. President, <clears throat> I'm saddened and deeply disturbed by the police shooting death of Mr. Ye Shang. Uh, family members of my constituents, uh, the deadly force on Amir Locke and Dante Rice still agonizing our hearts today. Uh, this, um, this incident, Mr. Ye Shang brought us closer to home because Mr. Shang was an SGU veteran who, whose regiment mission during the Secret War in Laos was to rescue American soldier and due to circumstance transport by on February 5th, his life was cut short. Although the incident under the investigation is by the, although the incident is still under, uh, is under investigation by BCA, in my view, the police body cam clearly show this altercation could have been handled without deadly force. Thank you, Senator Hurd. Yes, and in, in, in 2021, we put policy in place just to Senator Hur. real this. And so, Senator Hur. I just want to say my condolence go to the family okay. of Mr. Ye Shaw. Members. Thank you. I, with, with no disrespect to Senator Hur, we are getting far afield of what should happen during announcements of Senate interest. This has been a part of great discussion that I've had with the, with the front desk as well. Please only make announcements that are connected to Senate interest. We have belief in, and I uh, understand your feelings and thoughts, Senator Hur. But we really want to make sure that we get back to what is under Senate interest. So I just want to make sure that we are mindful of that. Okay? Uh, um, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Maybe we should talk about that. But I found that announcement very interesting, moving, and compelling. And I think this is the perfect place to do it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And I will talk with you offline. <laughs> All right. Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'm not sure if this falls in line with what you were just saying, but I thought it was of Senate interest that earlier this morning, Cleveland Cliffs announced that the North Shore Mine in Babbitt and the plant in Silver Bay will be, in fact, reopening in April. Uh, so the bridge that we provided them in unemployment extension will reach to that date. And I'm excited that uh, this came to fruition. Thanks so much for all your support. Any other announcements of Senate interest? Seeing none, Senator Kunish. Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until February 21st, 11 a.m. Uh, Senator Kunis moves, uh, uh, moves that the Senate is now adjourned. All those on that? Those in favor of that motion vote aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs>